Okay. So hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time today to join us on this webinar titled Taking IoT Further with Satellite Connectivity. My name is Rosalier, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get to the content, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Throughout the webinar, you'll see at the bottom of your screen a chat and Q&A portal. If you have questions, please submit them at any time through the Q&A portal, or you can chat with our, um, our hosts uh, through the, the chat function. We will have a lot of time at the end of the session to answer Q&A, so that's when all the Q&A will be answered, and we'll just jump into the content that you're here for. So without further ado, let me introduce our speakers today. First, we have Curtis Govin. He's the president of Flow Live. Welcome, Curtis. Do you mind giving the audience just a little snapshot of who you are? Yes, uh, thank you, Rosa. Uh, as you said, uh, my name is Curtis Govan, and I'm president of Americas for Flow Live. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background uh, so it'll, it'll be relevant to what we're talking about today. I'm actually, I'm in my 24th year of telecom. Uh, 16th year specifically focused on IT, IoT, and I have to tell you that I'm beyond excited uh, about our conversation today uh, because the technology that we're talking about has been long awaited for in the IoT industry, and if you've been a part of the industry for any time and you've deployed, uh, one of the things that you certainly would have heard is that coverage is king, and this solution uh, really, I, I would say, it puts the crown uh, on our global connectivity service there uh, so that we're finally going to have a, a full coverage footprint that is king of coverage. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you all for joining. And uh, I'll pass it back to you, Rosa. Thanks, Curtis. And now I'll introduce our other speaker, Parth Trivedi. He is our Skylo's CEO and co-founder. Welcome, Parth. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Thank you, Rosa. Really excited to be here and good to meet you all. Um, I'm uh, Parth Trivedi. I'm uh, one of the co-founders uh, and CEO of Skylo. Uh, it's a company that we founded uh, with the mission of converging cellular and satellite. Uh, and I'm extremely excited to partner with uh, FlowLive and with Curtis in sharing with you how we're doing that and how we're finally bringing uh, this converged connectivity uh, to IoT devices uh, around the globe with a very unique capability that I don't think would have been possible three or four years ago. Uh, and we're truly at an inflection point uh, in the telecom industry. And I'm really excited to chat with you all about it. Thanks, Parth. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic back to you and take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, so I, I think uh, most folks who are joining this webinar are probably already aware that the cost of compute and the cost of Tensing hardware is falling quite dramatically over the past few years. And that's resulted in a plethora of different devices reaching an installed base of over a billion devices uh, growing quite rapidly over uh, the next few years, which will have the opportunity to connect. And we'll jump into use cases in a second, but I just wanted to highlight the scale of the, of the opportunity here uh, across a number of different um, uh, LPWA, which is low power wide area uh, devices, uh, and NBIoT, for instance, is one category of devices. CATM1 is another cate category of devices. Uh, but in, in general, we sort of lump this all into um, LPWA. Uh, and this covers a, a vast range of use cases from utilities to agriculture to logistics. Um, and many of these use cases takes connectivity for granted that, you know, you're, you're going to always have connectivity where you need it. Um, but that's not always the case. Uh, and so there's a vast uh, percentage of devices that's actually not on this chart that would never have the opportunity to be on this chart unless a form of ubiquitous connectivity existed. And that's really the opportunity here is to grow the pie uh, by bringing uh, satellite to the world of cellular uh, and increasing the opportunity for more devices uh, to be connected for sensing in areas that just fundamentally wouldn't have been possible. Um, so uh, to highlight the, the scale and the magnitude of this, I think you and I, we, we take cellular for granted. You know, we're, when we're inside the house, we have Wi-Fi, we take connectivity for granted. We step out of the house, we're largely in uh, an urban area in a city. 
Uh, but I think the second you start driving outside of a city, I mean, think about the last time that you were on a cross-country uh, trip um, and think about the number of times that you actually lost connectivity. And this isn't just about, you know, large swaths of farmland where you don't have uh, connectivity. This is also about the Swiss cheese that exists in cellular, um, which just by design, the way you have to propagate RF in the cellular context uh, makes it nearly impossible to provide 100% coverage through cellular alone. Um, that actually leaves uh, a very vast uh, percentage of the population connected, but a vast percentage of the geography unconnected. So when we think about where are, where are people uh, working, where are machines working, where connectivity is needed? I mean, think about Maritime, for instance. The oceans are a great example of where cellular has zero coverage, uh, but where an, an, an immense amount of IoT activity and economic activity takes place, uh, which currently is, is you know, has, has no opportunity to be monitored. There's no telemetry uh, coming out um, at scale. Uh, when you think about, uh, for instance, the energy and utility sector, you think about renewable energies and the solar installation, off-grid batteries, uh, and again, other types of devices that don't have the opportunity to connect 100% uh, of the time. I live in California where, uh, you know, we're, we're a PG&E state, uh, and we constantly suffer from uh, this issue of down power lines, for instance. Uh, so there's, again, a unique opportunity to put extremely low-cost sensors to monitor vibration um, that, again, uh, you can't take for granted that you'll have connectivity in, in the areas where you have uh, uh, power lines. Mining is another great example of uh, an IoT use case where you have, uh, you have these large loaders, you have uh, mining equipment uh, that needs to be tracked, productivity gains uh, are otherwise lost when you don't have visibility of your equipment. And I can probably go on, but Perhaps a more personal example is think about the last time you went camping or you went uh, cross country cycling. Uh, and, you know, when you're going off on an adventure of your own, uh, you're now uh, more often than not uh, using some form of bike with uh, a monitor, maybe a crash helmet or something like that. That uh, you know, think about how much safer you'd feel if you had the opportunity to send a simple SOS from uh, your e-bike, which is a, an example of a consumer level IoT use case where connectivity can make a huge difference uh, if it existed ubiquitously. Now, unfortunately, there haven't been too many good options to expand connectivity uh, uh, in the past. You know, for cellular, the capex of putting up new towers is just way too high to justify putting up new towers in cell sites with low population densities. On the other hand, satellite has always been the solution of last resort, owing to the cost and complexity of hardware uh, and uh, the additional form of connectivity that you now have to add to your uh, assets and to your overall solution. And that means new hardware. So that means proprietary hardware that requires new antennas, new modems, a separate piece of device. You know, it's almost like carrying your regular cell phone and a satellite phone. Uh, and think about that for, for asset tracking, you need your cellular asset tracker, and now you need a satellite asset tracker if you want ubiquitous connectivity. That, that's really expensive to do from a hardware standpoint. And if you think about your TCO, your total cost of ownership, your monthly recurring on, on uh, satellite has historically been, again, an extremely expensive, orders of magnitude more expensive component uh, relative to cellular. And so converging these two industries uh, has always been something that folks have dreamed of, but until very recently has never been possible. Uh, and that brings us to a, a very important sort of inflection point in the industry. And that is that uh, the 3GPP, which is a standards body, uh, has finally ratified uh, the non-terrestrial network standards, the fancy way of saying satellite. Uh, but it, it basically means that now we are able to use the same protocols and the same waveforms that we did over cellular, albeit with certain modifications, such that the one and a half to two and a half billion chips that are produced, the, the modems that are produced by uh, your, your favorite modem maker, MediaTek, 
Qualcomm, uh, Sony, Altair, and, and the others in the IoT sector, you can now take those same modems and you can connect them over satellite. That's a major advantage when you think about just the simple bomb uh, of uh, the hardware that you're that you're wanting to provide ubiquitous connectivity to. Um, uh, and and the way that's done is through essentially a firmware update uh, with the latest release 17 standards, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but the way Skylo has been able to do it is essentially removed any kind of friction in adding satellite connectivity to um, existing cellular devices uh, by leveraging the 3GPP standards. Uh, and eliminating the need for any new RF uh, front end component or any new antenna uh, for you to connect over uh, satellite. Um, I'll talk about how we do that, uh, but uh, once that is possible, you can basically have the best of both worlds. You can keep your same device that you use for cellular, call it an asset tracker or maybe even a smartwatch, uh, and you now have optimal coverage uh, with the advantage of having uh, economics uh, from a TCO standpoint that are more comparable to cellular than it is to satellite. So how do we do this? Uh, there's, there's many different ways to approach this problem when it comes to the space segment. And, and you're all familiar with uh, sort of mobile towers on the ground. Satellites are nothing but mobile repeaters in space. And in fact, most satellites uh, are uh, bent pipe in nature, uh, which means they're reflectors in space. They're no different than sort of uh, repeaters or big mirrors in the sky. And the size of your mirror actually dictates the kind of link performance you can get uh, over satellite. And it also then dictates the kind of devices that can connect uh, over satellite. So there's a few different options. And you know, when we, uh, when we uh, started Skylo, we carefully evaluated what's the best combination of spectrum, um, satellite orbit and architecture that can get the best, can, that can deliver the best performance uh, for converged cellular satellite hybrid devices. And, and you've probably heard terms uh, like LEO and GEO uh, thrown out, you know, when you think about uh, upcoming and, and uh, previous generation satellite systems, uh, LEO is low Earth orbit, GEO is geosynchronous or geostationary, which is a subset of geos geosynchronous uh, orbit. Um, and the difference is basically the altitude uh, as well as the persistence uh, of coverage. So LEO satellites are typically between 400 and 2000 kilometers above Earth. Um, the velocity of these satellites uh, scales as the inverse square root of its distance from Earth. And that means that LEO satellites are zipping around much, much faster. Uh, one of the uh, advantages of having something closer to Earth is you get a little bit lower latency. Uh, but the disadvantage is you, now you need a lot of satellites because they're moving so quickly. Any one given satellite uh, might give you uh, access to connectivity perhaps once a day. Uh, so that's why you need hundreds, if not thousands of satellites in LEO to provide that kind of persistent coverage that GEO affords. Uh, now, geostationary satellites uh, are a very precise distance away from the Earth, such that uh, their velocity matches the rotational velocity of, of our planet. That means that they're essentially above a fixed point on the Earth at all times. So we always know exactly where the satellite is uh, above uh, the sky, and it provides persistent coverage over typically one third of the planet. And that's why uh, on, this, on this chart, you can see that three, sat three geo satellites are actually sufficient to provide uh, global coverage. Uh, you, you get a little bit of uh, a uh, hit on latency because of the distance that you're covering. But the major advantage that we have with geostationary satellites are, and this is actually not as well understood uh, in the industry, these satellites are massive. These are 12, sometimes 18 kilowatt satellites in space. And so they're able to radiate uh, uh, power and they have these massive reflectors, uh, typically the size of uh, an entire parking lot, uh, 20 meters, 22 meters uh, in diameter. Uh, so they're massive reflectors. So you have a massive ear in space 
And when you compare, compare that to uh, a two kilowatt uh, sized LEO satellite, you realize that you actually have far better link performance on existing geostationary uh, satellites than you do over LEO. Uh, and the spectrum that we choose to use is actually exactly within the bands of cellular. So it's between one and three gigahertz uh, corresponding to the L and the S band. Uh, or in LTE parlance, it's band 255 and 256. Uh, but the advantage is that now you don't need to reconfigure your hardware, your cellular hardware to connect to these satellites. And the advantage of using standards is that by leveraging this low power narrowband IoT standard, we were able to actually concentrate all of that RF energy in very, very thin slices of spectrum allowing us to deliver the range that is needed to actually hit a geostationary satellite in both directions uh, and create a, a two-way communication channel uh, where the device actually doesn't realize it's talking to a satellite that's 35,000 kilometers uh, above Earth versus talking to a cell tower that's only two kilometers away. And of course, you trade off bandwidth uh, in doing so. So it is a narrowband system. Uh, but when you're on cellular, you can leverage uh, CADM, you can leverage narrowband uh, or even 5G. And when you, when you switch from cellular to satellite, the device actually sees our network as just another friendly mobile network that it can connect to um, and uh, switches to narrowband IoT uh, NTN mode, which is uh, part of the release 17 standards, uh, and then sends and receives messages over satellite. Um, and happy to answer any any questions in the in the uh, Q and A about uh, any of this. Um, and go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, this was uh, actually a work in progress over a number of years. It didn't happen overnight. Uh, the three GPP, which is the standards body, has been uh, working on this for for a number of years, uh, and uh, we've been, uh, I would say part of the tip of the spear in this activity where our engineering team has sat very closely with the major tier one chipset companies uh, in um, sitting down with uh, others on the standards body and understanding how we can make this possible. So the scope for non-terrestrial networks was introduced in the latest release 17 standards and is now a part of release 18 and, and beyond. Um, and the capability that we have today is that the existing geostationary mobile satellite system, which is MSS uh, in the one to three gigahertz bands, uh, can support NBNTN, narrowband NTN, for two-way messaging on wearables class devices. You'd, you'd find it surprising to know that we've actually connected uh, a number of smartwatches directly over satellite uh, using the exact same RF front end and antenna that's uh, already in the device. Um, as well as cellular uh, asset trackers of uh, uh, various categories and including a printed label that you can stick on a container that you could stick on a truck or a parcel or a pallet uh, and track it wherever you go. Uh, so we finally have the ability to take advantage of two and a half billion chips that are produced per year uh, and proliferate connectivity where it couldn't have existed in the past. Now, what's exciting about using the standards in doing this is we are 100% interoperable uh, with uh, terrestrial carriers uh, like uh, FlowLife. So when we think about uh, how we integrate with FlowLife, there is zero change in behavior as far as the customer is concerned and as far as FlowLive is concerned, frankly, because to FlowLive, we are just another mobile network that they onboard. Uh, and the solution actually uses the same FlowLive SIM that you would uh, otherwise uh, get from FlowLive. It uses uh, the same hardware, though we have to certify it uh, onto our network, just the same way that AT&T or Verizon would have to certify your IoT device. Uh, but it doesn't consume any more egregious power uh, than uh, cellular does, which is also quite exciting. So it really eliminates any changes in behavior when you're consuming this new form of connectivity uh, and you actually receive a single bill uh, from FlowLive and you, you, you get offered uh, the, this converged uh, sort of plan, which includes uh, terrestrial and satellite in the same solution and in the same hardware. And uh, uh, if you go to the next slide, perhaps I can 
um, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the kinds of devices you can expect uh, this solution to come out on. So uh, uh, most uh, commonly, uh, we use modules in the IoT world. I'm really excited to share that our partners and friends at uh, Quectel and Murata uh, will be releasing uh, 3GPP release 17 NTN capable modules uh, starting uh, second quarter of uh, this year itself. So you can expect to start certain uh, early deployments, certain early trials of the system uh, and POCs, but uh, I'm, I'm incredibly excited to partner with the IoT ecosystem uh, in uh, making NTN possible at scale. Um, and with that, uh, Curtis, maybe I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, certainly. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, and like I said, really excited about what we're doing together here. Uh, so maybe we'll pivot here and, and kind of look at it from uh, our perspective. I think Paul covered a lot of uh, a lot of the components and how we come together, um, but really want to focus on what, uh, what our solution looks like and why we work. Uh, one of the fundamental things that we do as a company is that we look at how do we make complex simple for our customers. Uh, so as Parth said, we look at satellite networks and the integration just like we do any other mobile network. That's a good reason why we're in a partnership here because we think alike. So it's the same integration with our core network elements that we own. It's the same SIM as Part said, the same platform and same invoice. So simplifying that from the perspective of the customer. And then as part said, the device, com device components are also very simplified, um, same device as well. Uh, so when you look at the joint solutions now, we're really combining the traditional networks with NTN. So now as a customer, you have a single global hyper-local network. Uh, and I'll spend a moment on the hyper-local component because this is something that we've introduced and I wanna to, want to make sure that everyone understands what we're talking about. So basically with a single SIM, you have in any country in the world, you have access to more than one local carrier. In addition, you can have your data localized with the local core networks. We have dozens of core networks all around the world and we can localize the core network so that your traffic is local as well. The other piece there is that you have densely populated devices. We have a number of customers that they have thousands of devices that are a particular location. Think about uh, Industry 5.0 and, and the compilation of devices that can be in one location. But it's really common now that you see thousands of IoT devices in one location. And in that case, we localize further by putting them on a fully private mobile network. We combine with the radio access network and all of the other elements Flow Live provides. So we're localizing it on a fully private flow live network there. Uh, the other piece that comes into play is that these private devices on the devices on private networks, when they need redundancy or they need to move off of the private network, our SIM technology allows that to happen seamlessly. So moving between the, the private and public networks is seamless. And then of course, what we're talking about today is when you don't have cellular coverage, which as Prod said is is 70% of the planet. Now you'll be able to combine our release 17 NB uh, IoT over satellite service to basically have service everywhere on the planet. So this is the exciting part for us there that we're, we're combining these two technologies so uh, that we can have the, that global coverage truly be global everywhere on the planet. Uh, go ahead and it's in the type. So, you know, how are we different? Uh, this is important to know as well. Like we, we, the local piece I covered there, we're very much focused on uh, being globally local. Uh, and the primary things there are performance that you need. You need lower latency, you need uh, throughput performance there. Having something that's local is very important for that. And then there are regulatory compliance uh, issues where you have GDPR standards and other standards around the world like that, where data needs to remain within a region, within a country there. Uh, so that global local comes into play as well. Uh, the other thing about us that's different is that our infrastructure is device focused, particularly IoT device focused. We own the infrastructure, we've optimized our infrastructure and we can very often customize our infrastructure for particular applications versus what you would have with the traditional cellular networks where they're mobile phone focused, 
and IoT is an add-on to that. Our network infrastructure is 100% IoT optimized. Um, the other thing is that what we built are, are microservices uh, uh, that are fully cloud native or modern. Everything we've done, we've built our company over the last uh, five years, basically built new systems that are all based on the latest and greatest technology. So we're taking advantage of all of the um, things that you get with cloud native solutions where you have the elastic scalability, you have the automatic geo redundancy piece there. So the modernization of the technology allows us to provide a more robust solution as well. The other thing is um, we talk about real time versus offline. Uh, our rating system and our network events are all in real time. You know, the, the thing I tell our customers is that if I give you the winning lottery numbers today for yesterday's lottery, it doesn't really do you any good. So what we do is we give you real time data so that you can action that data immediately. And that's important for managing your business and optimizing your business and getting the most benefit out of the data that we're able to provide. Uh, the last thing here is that from a network persp perspective there, the network has traditionally been a black box. If you had an issue, if you needed to optimize the device, you had no idea of what was happening from the network. We're providing real-time network events that allows you to optimize your devices first. That's beneficial to you and to us uh, so that we can uh, use the network resources efficiently. Uh, most importantly, it allows customers to independently support their customers. Right, so if you have an IoT service, what you want is you don't want to call me, you want to be able to fix your problems and resolve your problems independently. The black box of the network is now open for you to do that. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Anna, for the next slide. So when we look at the benefits, you know, I'll, I'll kind of summarize this and, and won't go over them all in detail, but um, when you see what we're doing as a compilation of, of the solution that we have, and you're able to now open up the network and you have the coverage there, you've got more locations that are covered, uh, you've got the seamless access to our growing uh, database of networks, all within the single SKU of our SIM, and the additional things that you see here, there are three fundamentals that I think we look at. One, you have new use cases. That means that you're able to solve more problems from a, uh, an end perspective. Very often, those new problems that are solved there comes with new revenue opportunity or, op or efficiency in your business. Uh, and then the other piece there is that the vast improvement of operational efficiency with the solution that's real time that now allows you to solve many, many more problems globally. And then the ease of scalability. If you're doing everything with a single SIM, a single platform, a single core network that's globally uh, localized, the scalability factor becomes much easier uh, for our customers here. Uh, so uh, this is uh, basically the summary of, of, of the benefits there uh, that we have. And uh, you know, like I said earlier, we're extremely happy and excited to partner with our friends at Skylo here. Uh, we've looked at many people in the industry and they are uh, well ahead of a lot of the competitors there, if not all of them there. And we think we're combining together to bring a solution that is going to be outstanding for our customers. As I mentioned earlier, if coverage is king, uh, I think we'll be providing the king of coverage now. Thank you, Curtis. And thank you, Parth. Um, thank you for both the insights on and the perspective on the convergence of cellular and satellite. And now we're going to jump into questions. So we have quite a few popping into the portal. And as a reminder, please submit those if you have them in the Q&A portal. We will be answering them live. And for those that we don't answer live, we will follow up with you after the webinar. So everybody will get an answer to their question. Okay, let's go. First question. Well, uh, let me just apologize before we... Move to the Q&A. We had a technical issue here with the presentation. Uh, there's still one uh, roadmap slide uh, for a part, so I'll share it just now. Apologize for this. Sure, no problem. Okay, Path. I don't think I see it yet. This is because I'm not sharing. Thanks, Asaf. 
Yes. Uh, so in terms of uh, roadmap, uh, we are going to start enabling proofs of uh, concept uh, with uh, Flow Live. We're going to support Flow Live uh, in that uh, effort and make uh, an ecosystem of uh, various uh, dev kits and modules available. Uh, initial coverage uh, in Q2 is uh, going to be in Europe. Uh, subsequently, uh, it is going to be in uh, the United States. Uh, and I think you might want to advance uh, one. Yeah, perfect. So uh, we expect that we'll work in very close partnership uh, with uh, Flow Live's partners and customers uh, in making this happen. Of course, uh, we'll uh, let Flow Live take the lead. Uh, on these use cases, um, as well as uh, set forth the overall uh, sort of uh, requirements for this beta testing uh, uh, program and the criteria um, uh, for it. Uh, but we're really excited to help roll this out as quickly as possible. Um, you know, we're uh, connecting a plethora of different devices here in uh, uh, in our office in California. Uh, we can't wait for you to try this uh, new system of converged connectivity. Um, and for you to actually, for developers around the world to jump into this and start building and inventing new use cases that just wouldn't have been possible before. So again, super excited. Um, and uh, Curtis, maybe I'll hand it back over to you or, or Asaf. Yeah, I think we can uh, open it up for Q&A now. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we're excited about uh, the roadmap here and uh, can't wait to get to uh, get to this point where we have the global solution available. So thank you, Bob. All right, let's jump thank into you. questions. So um, first question, what is the megabyte ballpark cost comparison between NTN and terrestrial cellular today and going forward? Yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, the question that we would expect to come up first. Uh, I'll say uh, we mentioned earlier that it, it was several orders of magnitude higher uh, for traditional satellite. It, it's not nearly as high now. Uh, and there are different models. So the, the answer to that is a little bit complex. If we're looking at a prior, primary model, I would say it's relatively an order of magnitude higher than what you have for cellular. Uh, but the other model that we're, we're looking at that uh, most of our customers that now have cellular solutions, it will be the backup model. And that model is more of a uh, one that's it's like paying an insurance policy, right? Where you're paying a little bit extra for every device because a portion of those devices will have um, the need to connect to the satellite system. All right. And what is the maximum amount of data that a device can send per month in kilobytes? Or is there a limitation? Barth, I'll let you take that one. Sure. So you should really think about this as a narrowband system. The kind of data that you would expect to send over NB IoT is the kind of throughput that you should expect uh, from this system. It's it's really no different. So we're talking about order of magnitude uh, kilobytes. It can go up to hundreds of kilobytes, uh, but certainly you shouldn't be thinking about gigabytes uh, when you when you talk about uh, NTN. Uh, so it's a, it's a great complement for use cases uh, where your you're sending sensor data, you're sending two-way messages, you're sending alarms, SOS messages, um, and uh, other types of telemetry um, uh, back and forth uh, to your devices. Okay, and then thank you for that one. And do you, can you tell, uh, tell us something about the antenna size that is needed? Size, form, is there anything special? Looks like we may have lost part. Did we lose him? Oh, yep. I think he's frozen. He's frozen. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll say this in general. The uh, that uh, part noted this earlier. It, it's uh, one to three gigahertz. So it's the same uh, same antennas that you have today in the system. This is a key piece that, from a hardware perspective, there's no update required. Um, the the bands that are supported are within. Uh, the bands that you typically have uh, for existing hardware. So there's not a need to extend uh, a new antenna. This is really important for the solution. Awesome. 
Okay, um, let's see. Are there any recommended modules that we need or for or new developments that are that work with the network? Yeah, uh, part part highlighted the the Quactel and Norada uh, modules that are be available soon. Um, but we're we're talking to uh, all of the chipset manufacturers uh, as well, and you see everyone has a different roadmap. But it's in the roadmap for virtually everyone that uh, makes either modules or chipsets. Uh, so we will we'll expect to see those roadmaps get tightened up over the next uh, six months or so, and have some visibility into when the additional uh, providers will be able to have solutions. I'm sorry, by the way, uh, for of all the places I could have dropped connectivity, I didn't think uh, my 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 home uh, internet would have been one of them. But uh, I, I hope uh, I I answered the question before my internet dropped. You did, you did, you missed the question, but I I, I backed you up, man. Thank you. <laughs> that we had. Appreciate that. Yeah. Hey, that's the way it works, right? You know, cellular doesn't work. We got to go to cellular. Exactly. <laughs> seamless handover. <laughs> seamless, seamless. Very good. So, uh, there... We had a, a question someone asked to um, bring back a slide about the benefits because it was up for a short time. So, uh, Curtis, do you want to hold on? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, happy to go back to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if there's uh, one one thing in particular that that you would want to see here. Uh, we talked about the single SKU uh, of the SIM uh, from a business model perspective. Uh, I mentioned that for the first question there. There are two models that we're looking at. Uh, one would be a primary model. Uh, you can imagine these are solutions, and we're seeing these now where I've got assets that I 100% need to track all the time. Satellite is the primary solution there. And so that would come at a, at a much higher premium there, generally an order of magnitude higher than cellular. Uh, and then the backup solution there where we're paying uh, basically a premium for every device to have access to satellite for a uh, percentage of devices that would use it per month. Um, you know, we're talking about cost optimization there in general. Um, this is one of the things that I've been in the industry and I've seen people build cost, uh, actually companies on cost optimization there. And realizing that one, this is one of the things that I think has traditionally inhibited the growth of IoT. Uh, if you don't have full control over the cost, uh, then certainly you know you 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 are not able to grow and, and see the benefit uh, from a commercial perspective of businesses. So we start off with that in, in in that perspective. There, we do some things I won't cover in detail now, but we do some things that are very much different in the industry from a cost perspective to. Um, alleviate the need for customers to go and do uh, end of the month bill reconciliation, right sizing, things like that. We do it up front so that uh, that's not a need. Uh, we talked about the use cases there uh, and, and certainly Parth covers some of those. This is uh, the most exciting thing for me as a technologist is just to see the use cases that are gonna be unlocked by this technology. Uh, and that one is like every week we're hearing new use cases that are very interesting. I'll say I've been in the industry a long time and some of the new ones are, you know, are interesting things I haven't seen and heard before. So we're looking forward to that. Um, uh, the real time visibility and access and control all of that through the platform there uh, for people that are building a new uh, solution there. We basically have the ability if you're uh, an MVNO, a reseller, an application uh, service provider, uh, you can fully white label our solution. One of the things I didn't talk about earlier is that we have our own uh, telco grade BSS, so we can support beyond connectivity, so bundling full applications and selling that as a part of our multi-tiered um, platform that we offer. Um, alas, I'll say in here is that we, we have best in class uh, support, uh, been in the industry a long time. The people that we have in support 24, uh, 7, 365, they're ridiculously good uh, at um, troubleshooting issues. And one of the key things for them is they have access to all of the technology, including our core network infrastructure. So they're pulling logs real time, solving problems uh, extremely fast, and they're very very knowledgeable uh, in the IoT industry. 
Great. Thank you, Curtis. I hope that answered the questions on the benefits, and we'll go back to answering some questions in the Q&A. Uh, we have quite a few coming in, so keep them coming. Um, okay, what are the limitations related to the line of sight for a typical satellite? Sure, I can I can take that one, uh, Rosa. So uh, we we don't have uh, uh, so so of course the service is designed to work outdoors. Uh, you, you shouldn't expect a, a non-terrestrial network service to or satellite service to work uh, indoors. Um, but as long as you are outdoors and have relative access to open sky, and by relative I mean a line of sight adjacent, uh, is how we call it. Uh, the 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 network works through light foliage. Uh, we have a little bit of punching power, as you saw in uh, the link margin, uh, to to go through uh, uh, some of these kind of uh, natural obstructions. Uh, of course. In, in extremely dense sort of urban situations also, you'd, you'd typically be on cellular uh, and you wouldn't uh, expect to be on the satellite network anyway. So in most places where you use this, as long as you have access to open sky, you have connectivity. I think that's the, the, the most simple, sim simplest way to explain it. Thank you, Parth. Um, can you send SMS using the NTN connection to the device? By the way, I should highlight on the on the previous point that uh, our service works inside uh, car or has been tested to work uh, inside cars as long as your your device has uh, some some amount of uh, access to the sky. For instance, from the dashboard, it doesn't have to be on the car; it can be in the car, and it works at highway speeds. Uh, can you send SMSs uh, through this? Uh, we have IP and non-IP data delivery uh, mechanisms, so it's it's essentially uh, uh, not designed uh, to connect through SMS gateways at this moment in time, uh, in the tr traditional sense. But um, you should be able to connect to APIs uh, like Twilio, uh, through which you can trigger an SMS. Fantastic. Uh, what is the roadmap expectation for coverage over Africa and South Africa? Uh, we'll announce uh, a phased rollout uh, as we uh, go along here, uh, and uh, you know we have access to global coverage. We're just focusing our initial deployments on geographies where we have concentrated customer demand. Uh, that happens to be a, a function of Europe and uh, North America at this time, um, and uh, Africa, Australia, the countries are going to be a fast follow. But we will announce our uh, coverage roadmap uh, uh, in the coming in the coming weeks. Sounds great. And how long has this partnership been been live? Curtis, do you want to take that one? Uh, we've been we've been working together for a year in working on the solution, and and literally uh, from day one, we knew we were going to come together as partners. Um, so it takes took, takes time, as you know. There, uh, we're collectively doing development there, uh, but I think about nine months ago, we started uh, working on the partnership there. And uh, we have all of our agreements done and working on our integration and getting ready for uh, the European launch there and then followed by the Americas as well. So, yeah. Great. Um, I'm pouring through the questions right now. So if there's any, let's see, there's a lot popping in. Um, are there any restrictions around LOS to the sky, especially regarding downlink traffic? I think we already covered the the line of uh, LOS's line of sight. Uh, so uh, again, it's line of sight adjacent. You don't you can, it, can it, it works through sort of lightly forested areas. It, it you know, but just as long as you have relative access to the sky, it'll work. You don't need to point. By the way, you don't need any special kind of pointing. Uh, you don't need the device to be positioned in any certain way uh, for this to work. Um, and you use the exact same cellular antenna uh, without uh, any major considerations for how it is positioned. Okay, is Skylo suitable for fleet tracking? Yes. A simple question or simple answer. Um, uh, well, yeah. this, is, this is one of the applications. We have a couple of customers that are very much planning it for fleet. I mean, you, you can imagine uh, there are some fleets that are highly critical to track and uh, have very sensitive information that uh, they're carrying. So yeah, we're seeing this as, as um, uh, definitely an application for there. 
Uh, there, there was another question I saw, and I want to address this. The it was in regards to when you move from uh, satellite, uh, from cellular to satellite, how do you move back? Uh, so there are two ways that we do this. Uh, there's one uh, from our SIM technology that you can automatically switch between the networks there. We can do it based on timers, uh, based on loss of coverage for a particular time as well. Um, that's one of the automated ways. And then we also have what we call user control, uh, which is what most of our customers are doing because they're when it's a backup scenario, there's a commercial aspect there. So they're making the decision from a commercial perspective, how long do I want to be on satellite? How many reports do I want to send? And this allows them to customize that based on what their needs are and also based on what they're seeing from a device perspective in the field. Great. Um, the auto industry has advanced beyond basic telematics to infotainment options. Is there a path to combine this NB technology with that traditional satellite broadcast capability to deliver streamed content? Well, uh, there are certain unique advantages of satellite. For instance, uh, we can broadcast messages over a huge swath of geography, uh, which uh, uh, is otherwise not possible uh, using cellular. Uh, streaming is not a use case uh, that uh, we have currently planned for, for this year. Uh, for instance, streaming services requires uh, quite a lot more downlink bandwidth. Uh, so we are expecting to first cover uh, N NB NB IoT type use cases uh, with two-way messaging, uh, two-way IoT data. Uh, but certainly, uh, as we get down our own tech roadmap, which I haven't really spoken about, uh, we're certainly going to find uh, higher bandwidth applications pop up. Great. And we'll take one more question and then we'll wrap up. Uh, what is the volume of the devices to be connected? I.e., how many devices can be connected simultaneously and in total? Uh, over, I assume the question is for uh, uh, over satellite. Um, yeah. And so uh, our, our system is designed to be incredibly spectrally efficient. So we're, we're taking uh, satellite spectrum and really slicing it uh, qu quite a bit because of uh, the advantage that NB IoT provides um, uh, in terms of its uh, channel spacing and channel bandwidth. Um, so per, per NB IoT channel, uh, per sort of uh, satellite beam, it's a little hard for, for me to uh, sort of convey this in, in, a, in a very generic sense. But if you think about um, an overall geography like uh, Europe uh, at the moment, our current uh, coverage laydown uh, can uh, cover about 15 to 20 million devices um, with the amount of spectrum that the system is currently allotted. And of course, that can scale as uh, uh, more and more devices and more demand comes online. Uh, so that's only using 800 kilohertz of total spectrum, by the way. So it's, it's very efficient. Fantastic. And that, with that, we're going to wrap up, but I, I just want to turn it over to Curtis and Parth if you have any last comments or, or um, for our audience before we close out. Curtis, uh, off to you. Thank you. Uh, no, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, as I said earlier, I'm extremely excited about this technology because it's been long awaited. And we're seeing a number of uh, customers that are that are looking at the solution that are getting prepared for deployments there early stage of testing there. Uh, and certainly if you have any questions uh, that you, you have further that we didn't get to today, feel free to reach out to us and uh, we'd be happy to address those. But uh, thank you for attending. Uh, I actually wanted to also uh, say a big thank you to Curtis and uh, FlowLive for inviting me to this uh, webinar uh, and sharing this platform with you. Uh, honored to partner with FlowLive. Uh, extremely excited about uh, enabling this uh, new connectivity capability. And frankly, uh, the thing I'm most stoked about is what you're going to do with the service. Uh, I, you know, I'd be very eager to connect with you offline and understand the type of use cases that uh, you're thinking about uh, enabling perhaps existing use cases and existing types of devices that uh, you're thinking of bringing online onto this network so that we might be able to get a head start. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, I'm, I hope you enjoyed uh, the, the webinar and uh, uh, some of the takeaways uh, from it. 
and uh, happy to connect with you uh, uh, after this. Uh, perhaps, uh, uh, Rosa, we can share some of my contact details uh, with uh, panelists. Of course. And so as a wrap up to this session, so thank you both to Curtis and Parth. We will be sending out all of the Q&A, um, those that were answered and those that were not. We will send that as a wrap up in the summary to all of the attendees. You will also receive a recording of the webinar. So please pass that on to your colleagues and share with them. And you will receive a copy of the slides as well. So in that, we'll also include contact information for both speakers. And so please reach out. We'll, we're happy to answer any questions. And with that, I thank everyone for attending. And most of all, thank you, Curtis and Parth, for, for being our speakers today. Thank you, Rosa. Thanks, Parth. My pleasure. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you all. Bye-bye.